Justin. I'm Jamie. I'm Marius. And, and this, this is, is Comics Verse. Thank you for listening to another Comics First podcast. I'm not sure you're going to hear us more excited on another podcast besides this one because we are interviewing the renowned comic book creator Chris Claremont. Co-hosting this podcast with me for the first time is Marius Thienenkamp, all the way from Germany. Marius, it's been almost a year since your very first podcast, which was Grant Morrison's New X-Men. How does it feel to be co-hosting a year later after your first podcast? Hi, Justin. I'm like extreme, extremely excited, like hands down. I'm probably as excited as uh, I was when I first recorded like my very first podcast for comics verse so yeah but I'm, I'm really looking forward to that experience as well so. awesome yeah no it should be good and that was a crazy experience back then and I think we're gonna top it today by talking to Chris Claremont which I can't believe <laughs> what and when was your first experience with Claremont comic book I think that the first Claremont comic book that I read was like when I was I don't know 12 year old or something in seventh grade and uh, I actually got my hands on uh, X Men: The End, so that's something like the oh, first wow. Claremont story that I'm gonna read is like the end of the X Men franchise. <laughs> that's pretty cool, you know. And it's another X Men podcast. So, what would an X Men podcast be without Ms. Jamie Rice? Right, Jamie? It would be nothing. It would be well. That's the same thing. My life would be without Ms. Jamie Rice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome. You're so good to me. Our, is it, yeah, I, I try. <laughs> So I know you came to Claremont and X-Men Comics a little bit more recently. Do you want to tell us about your relationship with Chris Claremont's X-Men Comics and uh, X-Men Comics in general? I would love to. I came to Chris Claremont and X-Men together because we started talking about the comics that I was into. And then Justin was surprised that I had never read X-Men. So he put me on the X-Men podcast and he told me I had to read Dark Phoenix Saga. And I loved it. And I was obsessed with it. And I love Jean Grey. And I also love Emma Frost. And Jean Grey is obviously one of the most divisive characters ever. But I think that my relationship to Claremont from that moment on was always really positive. Um, Because then we did the New Mutants. So we got to do more Chris. And yeah, I would say that my relationship is extremely excellent with it. And I would say it's due both to how amazing he is and you for giving me the chance to love it. Oh, thank you. You know what's crazy, (laughs) Jamie? I sat in this very chair on it. On this couch, actually, rather, since this is not a chair, was K Honda, Chris Masari. On Skype, there was both Marius and Corey Spanner. And you know what they all told me? That they were, they either did not like Jean Grey or they were indifferent. Yeah. That's insane. Isn't it insane? Marius, can you explain this Jean Grey indifference? I don't know. I, I feel like she's one of the characters that's just so important to the franchise that. Like, I kind of just accept the fact that she's there. She's, like, part of it. But I don't really have, like, an opinion on her. Except for, like, the the Brian Michael Bender's Young Jing Wei, which I really enjoy. So, that's that. I wonder what you guys would do if all of a sudden I just died and then, like, a 16-year-old me just showed up and was like, yo. I think I'd be fascinated. I think I'd be very interested to know more about it. (laughs) We should write a comic book about that. Brian Michael Bendis already did. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's just not starring me that's the that's the problem <laughs> jamie how do you think the dark phoenix saga set up the x-men franchise from that point forward i think it hits upon all of the key elements of x-men or at least all the elements that always worked the best about x-men and i think that it really solidified gene and scott's relationship in a way that i think is really compelling and interesting and continues on I mean, you said we did the podcast about a year ago now, which seems crazy on Grant Morrison's run. And I feel like a lot of the interesting parts of that run are connected to a lot of the ideas and concepts that were laid down in Dark Phoenix, especially with their relationship. The only thing that I want always want more of is Emma Frost. And there's not a ton of Emma Frost in Dark Phoenix. She's there, but not a lot yet. But even then, it kind of establishes all of these key players in these key spots. I mean, even establishing kind of storm in her leadership role it is alluded to and shown there too i think all of my favorite aspects that people run with later on in x-men are present especially the very complex loving and difficult to understand relationship between scott and gene oh. and i think that's why it's so important <laughs> love, love is scott summers and gene gray well, yep. love is Scott Summers and Jean Grey, especially in Dark Phoenix Saga. Right. That tears me open every time. I want to sing Love Is by Brian Somebody and Vanessa L. Williams, but I'm a really bad singer. That would have, I, I can imagine it, though, and I think I feel it. I think that Scott and Jean know what you mean when you say that. Right. 
Probably. And that's, they feel you. And that's the great thing about Claremont's writing is that Scott and Jean seem like real people to me. So I believed you when you said that. Thank you. I mean, I think just like to riff on it a bit, I know that the problem that some of the people at Comixers have with Scott and Jean is they feel like they're these cardboard kind of stereotypes and this annoying couple. But in Dark Phoenix Saga, they don't feel that way at all to me because they just feel so... I don't, like you said, like, they just feel so fleshed out and real. I just feel like Jean's issues, as well as Scott's issues, both, they don't feel overly operatic or dramatic or cliche. They just feel like they're, they're issues. I'm, yeah, I'm, I agree. I'm with you. Like, I mean, Claremont is uh, one of the most, like, fan favorite X Men writers of all time for a reason. I feel like, especially his way of kind of method acting and uh, wanting to flesh out his characters and wanting them to be, like, real persons uh, with real struggles. It's, work great and i think that's probably why his six uh, 17 years run is just so iconic to to so many people especially taking a look at uh, what he's done to the characters of uh rogue and gambit of uh, kitty pride kitty pride especially storm mm-hmm. as well storm became leader of the x-men under his run yeah right dazzler he brought dazzler long shot into the mix i love dazzler right so much. she dazzles man she has the best that's the best concept for a superhero ever, in my opinion. She just like does her you, dazzler thing, and then you're just like, because you're just dazzled. Did you hear about the rumors of how she's probably going to be in X Men Apocalypse? No. Oh, uh, just like weird set set photos with like Taylor Swift and. Oh, I heard the, about that uh, rumor. Yeah, I heard about that rumor. And like the the X Men actors, like uh, I don't know, Nicholas Hoult and James McAvoy. Yeah. So and Jennifer um. Lawrence, yeah. I, I think that Brian Singer once hinted on the fact that uh, Dazzle is gonna, probably going to be in the movie. So uh, many people thought that she's probably going to be star, uh, starred by by Taylor Swift. So what's your thoughts on that? That? My, oh, you, you go, Jamie. You go. Well, I, I would say I do read the internet. I just try to avoid spoilers at all costs. Um, so I'm not an imbecile. But that could be okay. But based upon the acting... I saw from Taylor Swift in Valentine's Day. That's very upsetting to me. And I love Taylor Swift. And I think that she is a very, very good businesswoman and does a lot of important things. But I'm not convinced that she is going to be able to sell that. But then again, I love Dowser, but I'm not 100% certain. She could probably, she could sell what she had to sell, I think, about Dazzler. Joining us today is Columbia University law student Jake Grubman. How are you, Jake? I, I forgot to mention that you're also Comics First Independent Indie Comics Editor. Yes, great. It's uh, a fantastic spring day today. It Plus, is. we get to talk to one of the most prominent comics writers of all time. So, all in all, a pretty good day. That's very exciting. Why don't you tell us about your first experience reading a Chris Claremont comic book? Well, I think I should say to start off, I got to the comics game pretty late. And so by the time I started reading comics, Claremont had been off of X-Men for probably almost 20 years. But oh, wow. I really feel like his interpretation of those characters in X-Men is what informed our view of superheroes in general in that period. I grew up in the 90s, and during that period, I think the X-Men were really the most prominent superhero group so that sort of informed my early understanding of comics awesome uh marius okay Okay, cool so first off i'm gonna give you like a quick introduction to mr claremont so mr claremont was born in november 1950 in the uk and raised on long island in the u.s and he's famous mostly for his 1975 until 1991 run on the uncanny x-men comics However, he didn't get into the comic book industry right away and initially studied acting and political theory at Bard College. So, um, however, after doing some work on titles such as, uh, for example, Daredevil and the Black Widow and Iron Fist, he was offered to take over the X-Men in 1975. And he actually had one of the, uh, no, he had the longest run of any writer ever on Marvel's Merry Mutants. And it was overwhelmingly successful and probably many fans favorite run and yeah his work also includes uh, books such as new mutants excalibur but also the creator owned sovereign seven published by dc as well as for example his novel trilogy chronicles of the shadow war for example but yeah his uh, style has been described as uh, complexly structured uh, soapy and uh, taking his characters extremely seriously and well he's been awarded for that numerous times with several comic book uh, comic bias fan awards and eagle awards but also by uh, being accepted into the will eisner award hall of fame so yeah 
That's really exciting. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Claremont. Pleasure is mine. So, you know, Marius mentioned some really interesting things, and I kind of want to dive in uh, with your education at Bard College. We did read that you studied political theory and theater, and I was mm-hmm. wondering what kind of theater training you had there. I-, I did read somewhere else that you were a method actor, but I had trouble finding where I first read that. Is that true? Not a method actor, no. Was there? I never went to the, I never went to the actor's studio. Oh, okay. So did your kind of acting training at Bard College, did that affect the way you write characters at all? Probably, but... Actually, when I was at Bard, my goal wasn't to be a writer. It was to right. be an actor. So I came to New York to be as, well, an actor. Writing was just something I did occasionally to pay the bills. Very cool. I have to say, I originally came to New York to be an actor, too, and wound up here talking about comics, which I'm very happy about. So it's sometimes difficult for people to understand how comics are looked at even in my time. Um, there, sometimes people don't take them seriously. And, you know, it was so great taking that class at Columbia University where comics were treated as high art. And that's what we tried to do at Comics First. And I was reading about when you uh, got back into comics and you were reading Fantastic Four, I think it was 48 to 50. And you were describing those comics as really brilliant. And I was wondering for you, when you got back into them and you were reading those issues, what sort of emotions they conjured up for you and what about them made you, did you find brilliant? I'm not sure brilliant as a specific word Mm -hmm. is a little highfalutin, I guess, in that context. What I found them, what I found with the FF in Stan and Jack's run, especially at that particular juncture where he and Jack were, were hitting their stride and scoring continuous both creative and technical, I guess, milestones was It was a tremendously fun read on a par with the, the strips in England's Eagle magazine that I read as a much younger person. Uh, things like Dan Dare and uh, Ralph Bellamy's Hero of the Spartan. Heroes of the Spartan. The visuals by Jack were just extraordinary and the characters visually evoked by Jack and textually by Stan were interesting. I literally wanted to see what was going to happen next, uh, which is the hallmark of any good serial, whether it's print or television or movies. And that was pretty much it. The, the FF led me into Thor, again, by Stan and Jack, which in turn led me into the Avengers by Roy Thomas and John Buscema. And I found it a lot more fun, a lot more interesting, a lot more enticing than anything I was seeing at that point from DC Comics, except for occasional hallmarks like Green Lantern, Green Arrow, and, well, occasionally the Legion of Superheroes. My working, my freshman year at at Bard, I spent two months working in this, I guess, the winter of 1969 uh, at Marvel as what was then called a gopher, what is now referred to more formally as interns. And that was where Roy Thomas and Neil Adams' first issue of X-Men was coming through the office on the way to the printer. And for me as a reader, and also, I guess, as a member of the staff, it was just extraordinary to see what Neil was doing visually, what Roy and Neil were doing in terms of storytelling, and I just thought they were cool characters. And that run of X-Men led ultimately to the my first successful, I guess, attempt to uh, wiggle my way into the X-Men canon by helping Roy out with a resolution to the his Sentinel arc. In his case, he he was trying to figure out how to get rid of the Sentinels, how could the X-Men defeat these indefeatable steel monoliths? And I came up with the, I guess, what you could call a MacGuffin, which is if Sentinels are determined to eliminate the source of mutation on the Earth, ultimately the source could be ascribed to solar radiation, which meant if you wanted to neutralize evolution on the earth you had to neutralize the sun so off they went end of story for them until of course they came back 
<laughs> right. And now they're super. Oh, now there's a Sentinel who is Cerebro, actually, which is pretty crazy. If you say so, I, I'm, I, I'm afraid I am not as current with continuity as others. <laughs> That's okay. I've been. Marius and I have been catching up on our X Men to prepare for this uh, interview. It's it's funny because you talked about the two month field period, right? That they were gonna you were gonna have with Marvel. When you were walking into the Marvel office, were you still kind of looking at definitely being an actor, or were you gonna say to yourself, "Wow, I'm really into comics. I'm gonna come in. I'm gonna make my mark." Or what was? No, I was a poli- at that point in my freshman year. I was a political theorist who was having fun learning how to act. Oh, very cool. I just done. Four Shakespeare plays and a Moliere play my freshman year, the fall of my freshman year. But in Bard used to shut down for two months, January and February of every year for what was called field period, where you were expected to go out and get a job related to your major subject. Well, my major subjects were political theory and acting. Coming from a leftist, hippie, drug den school in upstate. New York in 1969, January of 1969, the likelihood of getting any kind of political job, either locally in New York or certainly not in Albany and certainly not in DC, was minimalist at best. Broadway was in a doldrum at that particular point in time that no one was looking, was hiring anybody for anything on or off. And so through a friend of my parents, uh, mad cartoonist Al Jaffe, he basically said, would I be interested in working for Marvel? And I said, sure, why not? And next thing I know, the phone rings and Stan says, hey there, true believer, this is Stan Lee. <laughs> Just how you know how he actually said <laughs> this amazing. conversation many times. You know, he said he had no problem with someone coming in and working, you know, for two months, but Marvel had a very tight budget and they couldn't pay very much. And I said, well, we're supposed, technically we're doing this for academic credit, so I'm not allowed to ask for money. Next thing I knew, he said, you're fired, you're hired. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and there I went. Marvel was always on the, on the lookout then and now for good talent, cheap. And so I went, I went to work for them for the winter of 69. Uh, I should point out a year later, I was in uh, Israel, just north of the Negev, working on a kibbutz for the same two months, which, you know, the idea was each year you would find different things to do related to your major and gain practical experience to balance out the academic experience of getting a degree. And that's what I did. At the point, I had no intention of working for Marvel in any way, shape, manner, or form. It was just a cool gig. Right. That's and cool. once I got out and was in New York looking for, you know, as a young actor, working, selling freelance work to Marvel and trying to sell it to DC was a convenient way, I thought then, of paying the bills. I think that's a pretty incredible story. Yeah. You know, and I almost feel bad. Well, considering actually- our page rate was something like 10 bucks a page. It was. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was a gentler, kinder, cheaper era. <laughs> I have to say that's probably more than our interns make, so I think you were <laughs> you're doing okay. Um, Sadly, it's probably more than many professionals make. Oh, yeah. I think I mentioned before that I had studied at Columbia with Paul Levitz, and a lot of the beginning mm-hmm. classes, we talked about how poorly the creators were treated by the, the publishing companies. And I think it's you know really unfortunate, especially when so much of the groundwork was laid for comics to become great pretty soon after. It was what it was. I mean, that was, I don't think comics was any more or less exploitative of mm. their talent than uh, many other publishing companies. So it was just like it that. Was just like that. Okay, I see. Every every boss tries to get their their talent for the lowest possible rate, except I guess, well, even in LA, as long as you're Dalton Trumbo, the best writer in the business, you can sign contracts up, down, and sideways. The minute you become blacklisted, you're selling for nickels. That's it's a reality. It's it's a mar- it's a commercial market. You have to find a way to adapt to the rules. 
Yeah, so you're saying it was common in many industries, especially in publishing, for talent to be treated like this back then. Is it still similar now? I hate to ask that question, but I would like to think that it's gotten emphasis is more on taking care of the talent and creators. Uh, I think you can get an equally eloquent argument on both for both answers. It is, it isn't. It depends on the creator. It depends on the company. It depends on the perception of the company's management to its status in the industry depends on the bottom line, always on the bottom line. But that's that's the reality with any creative organization, whether it's comics, music, film, television, what have you. Those are the kinds of questions, I guess, that are probably most appropriate to an interview with uh, Axel, mm. not me. I gotcha. Since he's... Oh. He's on the management side of the equation, and it's very much a reality defined by by the management, mm. whether it's right. Axel as editor in chief, or the president of Marvel Comics, or Ike as a primary shareholder. So I was gonna say, I almost feel terrible asking you so many questions about X Men because you know we we did some research and watched some of your other interviews, and of course it's such a, a prolific book that you worked on, and you worked on it longer than anybody else. But you also wrote books you wrote lots of other comics superman and marius did a lot of research on sovereign seven which is really great mm -hmm. but i feel like yeah you know a lot of people commented who were working with you and they said these characters were so real to you and it's funny because we did a podcast on rogue i want to say episode 40 i think this is episode 72 and we went back and we read a bunch of old rogue comics and then i realized that having grown up reading your X-Men comics that although Rogue was never, you know, a character I looked at and said, oh, that she was my, you know, necessarily my favorite character. But while we were doing the podcast and we were talking about her, I realized that, you know, I knew her, that I had this mm -hmm. close relationship with her, even though, you know, maybe she's not my Jean Grey, as people would make fun of me as being one of my favorite characters or my Cyclops. But I was wondering when you go back and you think about this time when you were writing X-Men, what are the characters that, that you took with you once you finished writing them and, and which are closest to you? Pick one. Pick one. Storm. Yes. <laughs> so do you, do you love them all I, equally like children? No, no, no. I've known these guys for 40 years. Right. I don't play favorites. Right. Then or now. They're all, it's, you know, I probably feel more strongly towards those characters I defined, like the half dozen X-Men that, that Len and Dave, Len Ween and Dave Cockrum created that I developed than to the five original characters created by Stan and Jack, except that what I've done with Jean over the years has sort of pushed her over the line into, I guess, my favorite side of the, of the street. But I've known them all too long. To play favorites is, doesn't quite fit right anymore. So if someone says, who's your favorite character? My answer, truthfully, is the one I haven't created yet. Mm. Although probably the more accurate answer are, is my favorite characters are the ones that I create that I own, as opposed to the ones that Marvel owns or DC owns. But that's the, I, also the way of it with with any creator. You may think you have a, a sense of affection. You know, uh, for all I know, Jack had a tremendous affection perhaps for the FF, but ultimately they're not his to play with. They're Marvel's to play with. And sadly, whatever his vision of them, it will be changed when it's done by John Romita Sr. or John Buscema or John Byrne, going down the list to me and Salvador La Roca back at the turn of the century. I mean, every writer has a sense of, I guess, I don't know, affection or possession for the characters they work on. I would suspect George R. R. Martin feels much more of that towards the characters in Game of Thrones than he did towards Beauty and the Beast, simply because one is his and one isn't. But uh, that's everybody has that, that dichotomy within themselves. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's actually funny that you bring up Jean Grey because she was part of my next question. There's so many papers uh, when you go look up the Columbia University archives and you do some research on Jean Grey. And there's a lot of information about her and 
her as a response to the feminism that was going on in the 70s. And I guess I was wondering if, if that... How do you mean by response? That there was the feminist movement that was going on in the 60s and 70s and that Jean Grey was reflective of that was my understanding mm-hmm. of what I read. And I was just wondering... Oh, you oh. mean you draw a woman with her own sense of character, an independent spirit, a mind of her own, heart of her own, turn her loose in a world ruled by men and conflict develops? I can't imagine where one would see that. <laughs> I mean, it's almost like four guys ganging up on a woman running for president. <laughs> that wouldn't happen. Not in America. No, she'd probably whack them all. <laughs> <laughs> Not in America. And Jamie, you know, you yes, and I have talked. Actually, that's amusing because wouldn't happen in Germany, wouldn't happen in England, wouldn't happen in India. They just elect the woman. Mm-hmm. You know, I have to say, and I, and I don't want to get off topic, but I, I have quite an argument as someone who studied a, a tidbit of ancient Roman history that some women in ancient Rome had enjoyed more prevalence in the Roman political system than some women do in the American political system. Oh, I that's just because really you've probably read I, Claudius. <laughs> no, I never read I, Claudius. <laughs> I saw the movie, though. Well, you, you have the definition of Livia right there. Of Oh, of her and I, Claudius, you mean? Julius's wife. Not Julius, sorry, uh, Octavia's right. wife, Livia. Yes, the first empress of Rome. Right. The background, the, the backseat power of the empire. Right. Um, she did everything she could to make sure her children inherited the throne. And, and she did it, yeah. And, and she it and look what happened. It. Yeah, right. Also, Agrippina the Younger comes to mind when I think of, mm-hmm. uh, and she was the second Roman empress, I think, if you go by whatever they were going by when I was reading that. But I think that's really interesting. Uh, Jamie, do you have any thoughts or, or on anything Mr. Claremont said you about never asked your question Jean about Jean Grey? So. Oh, no, it's okay. I was going to have uh, Jamie add to it, too, since she's studying feminism at Elon University. Um, well, I mean, my thing about Jean Grey and just about a woman being let loose in the world is that I think that I always enjoyed Jean and I always enjoyed Dark Phoenix Saga because I thought that Jean and her desires and her flaws were so real. And I feel like even just listening to you talk about how you can't pick your favorite character, I almost wonder, when you think about Jean, how would you describe Jean to another person? She should have stayed dead. Mm. (laughs) That's always true. No, I mean, if you're going to write a tragedy, write the tragedy. The thing about Dark Phoenix was that the ending came about as a synergy of accidents, but it was Mm. the right, it was everyone's creative instincts coming together for the common good and the end result is a story that was both meaningful dramatically thematically characterizationally and emotionally and it should have stayed that way from my perspective as writer it's the sole reason that three year two years later we created rachel because we needed someone to assume that mantle but again the idea is with the new mutants and the x-men we wanted i wanted a young growing for want of a better term adolescent cast because in that respect there is still a tremendous opportunity potential what have you for everybody to screw up to make mistakes to learn from the mistakes by the time one is in their mid-twenties, everything is becoming a lot more solidified. You've made your decisions. You you are moving ahead with life. For the most part, grown-ups, for want of a better term, are boring. The, the, path, the paths of their lives are set. You can have, I have had fun playing with the Fantastic Four, but let's face it, Reed, Sue, Ben, Johnny, they are what they are. The only way you can, at least for me anyway, that one could scramble the paradigm in an interesting and dramatic manner was by doing something overtly dramatic, like putting Reed in Doom's suit of armor and having him gradually over the course of the arc turn into Doom mm-hmm. for the best of reasons, because the road to hell, et cetera, et cetera. The thing with the X-Men was to try and hold on to the idea, though we did it more in the New Mutants than in the X-Men because they were the X-Men started out as being demonstrably older. 
than that we were used to seeing. To give them the capacity to make mistakes, to be kids. The thing that drove Kitty crazy was that by rights she should be with the New Mutants. She's a kid, but she's she her attitude is she earned her place with the big guys and she was going to stand with them, but she was still a kid. And I was determined to hold on to that aspect of her as long as possible. The same would go for Nightcrawler. The same would go for Peter. There's the idea of marrying off Scott and having him and Madeline live happily ever after was an acknowledgement that he has gone beyond childhood. He has now moved up to the level, to that stage of life that is comparable to the, to Reed and, and Sue. He is a father. He is a husband. He is starting a family. He has to take responsibility for his life and for the lives around him and leave the fun and games more to the, to everybody else. That was why when, when the pitch was presented for X Factor, my counter proposal was that Jim leave Gene dead. Because aside from the fact we've just spit in the eye of all the readers who have bonded with the X-Men because of the reality of that death, who felt it deeply, I mean, as far as anyone can tell, there's only one real-world analog for that circumstance where somebody actually dies, stays dead for a period of time, and then comes back. To do that, in this instance, to say that Gene, what happened with Gene was a lie, to me, instantly disenfranchised everybody who felt something for that moment, a sense of loss, a sense of betrayal, a sense of whatever, but who got over it and moved on, as we all must do in real life, and it instantly devalued whatever, how could we ever, I mean... God knows I played. We did it with Gene. Will we do it with Storm? That card more than once. But we could never do it again because now that you're saying, ha ha, it was a joke. So my pitch was Gene Gray has an older sister hmm. who's unattached and has superpowers. And oddly hmm. enough, the superpowers could relate to X Factor because the power she had was to detect and catalyze mutants. So if you walk up to a kid, she zaps him with a power for like 30 seconds or five minutes or whatever. You get to see what that per that kid will be when he or she hits puberty and the power comes in and you can deal with him. But more importantly, she's an unattached gray, which instantly, A, you've got Scott and Madeline as the grownups raising their kid and running the team. But B, with Rachel, sorry, with Sarah. Suddenly, Bobby and Warren and Hank are in play. Right. If you bring back Gene, you're just recreating the original paradigm, and the other three guys become afterthoughts, which they did. Mm. This way, they can move center stage. Even if none of them end up with, with Sarah, the sexual tension, perhaps, will at least keep the readers on their seat. I thought it was a good idea. I could have had fun with it. Jim felt he was, he had already made a commitment and he didn't want to turn back on it. Oh, so wow. it's funny too, because I remember, I always wondered why Sarah never had mutant powers that I had read about. And I remember there being a specific issue where I think they were at the bottom of the ocean or something and, and Sarah passes out and Jean said, Oh my gosh, my sister passed out. She's not used to all this X-Men stuff. And mm -hmm. um, it's really interesting hearing about that now. Jake, I know you have class soon. I know you had some, some questions you wanted to ask. So I wanted to kind of let you go first. At some point, I do want to get back to the question, which I so rudely interrupted you about Jean Grey and, and having a conscious effort on your part and making her the phoenix about feminism stuff. But we'll come back to that in a second. Jake, do you want to go ahead with some of your questions? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I don't want to interrupt the flow if, if you want to. The great thing about flow is that there's editing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, th first of all, thanks so much again for uh, taking the time to talk to us. No, it's a real My pleasure. A real honor for all of us to uh, have this conversation. First of all, uh, you were discussing some of the early parts of your career a little bit before. Now, I've read that when you first considered your career, 
you weren't all that excited about comics because uh, there was decreased readership and also because of what I think I've read you you thought was uninteresting material. Uh, obviously, a lot has changed in comics in the intervening period, but how do you think you'd, you'd feel about the industry and potentially working in the industry if you were just getting started today? I'd probably think twice. I mean, back in 1969, 1970, when I started, comics as we know them was, we considered a, a dying industry. I don't think any of us had a, we figured probably by 1980 it would be all but dead. Sales were collapsing. There was no direct market. There were no comic book stores. Newsstands were falling all over the place. On the other hand, they were fun toys to play with. Doing the X-Men, I had the chance to work with Dave Cockrum who was and is one of the great talents of of the modern era. And he revolutionized not simply the X-Men at Marvel, but the Legion of Superheroes at DC. But more importantly, I and Dave and John Byrne and Paul Smith jumped into the X-Men at a point in time when it was a completely fresh concept. The 50 issues that had gone on before with Stan and Jack were for the most part irrelevant to what we were doing simply because it was a B-list book. Even then, that occasionally with a couple of issues by Jim Steranko and, and the 10-issue run by Neil and Roy Thomas, moved up into the A list or the B B plus list. By the again, the thing with the X Men was in those days, by the time everyone realized the sales had jumped up in response to Neil's work on it, Neil had already left the book and gone back to DC. So what I had uniquely at Marvel were brand new characters. The concept existed, but the characters except for Cyclops, were totally off the shelf. They were brand new. Even Wolverine, who'd been in two or three ep issues, the concept that Dave and I came up with was totally different and antithetical to the concept that Len had envisioned for him in the first place. Len Wein's vision of, of Logan was he was a young punk, which is to totally valid, but also that the claws were part of the costume, not him, which was Dave's idea and absolutely brilliant. It was one of those things that helped catalyze my feelings and the, the audience's feelings, certainly, about the character. Holy cow, he has claws, adamantium claws coming out of his hand. Well, you got to think about that for a minute. He is basically stabbing himself. Every time those claws come out and go back, that's got to hurt. As Anna Paquin says in X-Men 1, looking at his hand and saying, does it hurt? And Hugh Jackman looking at the hand, looking at her, looking back at his hand, looking out the front, and then just in two words, crystallizing the character of Wolverine on film for everybody just by saying every time. That's iconic. That's what you need. Well, that that's the iconic moment. That's the de definition for Wolverine. That's why in one of John's issue, John Byrne's issues, I have Storm yelling at him and saying, stop being so profligate with the claws. You don't need the claws. You've got adamantium, unbreakable adamantium bones. You are a kick-ass martial artist. Beat the living crap out of them. You don't have to cut them into, into shish kebab. <laughs> and at the same time, you don't have to be slicing yourself open to do it. So she's trying not to get the adversaries killed, but at the same time, she's trying to find a way to spare him ongoing pain. He may be used to it, but it, it's got to hurt. So to me, we had all these great characters, and nothing about them was known. 
So I got to make up everything. So the end result of, of my 17 years was that I had built a history of these, of the characters, of the concept, of the school, of the reality. Even Magneto, who had been around for years, I was able to give a life to that helped define him in a way that is still dominant in both comic printed portrayal and cinema portrayal. You can't do that with any other character at Marvel because they all had backstory by the time we came along. The FF existed, the Avengers existed, the Defenders existed, Spidey existed. They all had their history. They all had a life. All you could do was play with the tapestry that Stan and Jack or Stan and Steve Ditko had laid out for you. X-Men was unique. And that kind of gift won't happen again, especially in today's commercial environment. The other thing to bear in mind is that because when Dave and I started on the X-Men, it was a quarterly. Okay, when we took over, when I took over, it became a bi-monthly. But a bi-monthly B-list title, it was nothing. I mean, if anyone had the slightest inkling of what we were going to turn into, I wouldn't have been led anywhere near it. Len would have held on to it till death and would have had a hell of a lot of fun, I'm sure. But I got the golden, I got, you know, the Willy Wonka card. I got, you know, the key to the kingdom. And it allowed me to just have fun without anybody noticing. We were so far down the totem pole in terms of I mean, what everybody was focused on and interested in was the FF, the Avengers, Spider-Man, even the Defenders, not the X-Men. By the time the realization spread that we had a hit on our hands, and not just a hit, but something really special, it was all, it, it was all locked in place. That's the sort of holy cow moment you don't get very often. And I don't think in the modern film publishing conglomerate reality that's possible anymore. I mean, now you're, one is writing as a complement to the films that are being generated out of the material. So everyone is constantly being aware of what the other guy, i.e. the film guys, are doing. And also, Marvel was a totally different creative environment then. Stan was still boss, active boss, not a figure on a, on a ledger. And his attitude was, I give you a book to write, your job is to write it. I don't want to hear from you. I got more important things to worry about, like the other 50 books. And the rule is, it's simple. You got to be on time. The book has to sell and don't be an a-hole. Two out of three you can get away with. <laughs> but three would be nice. But the thing was that with Stan, he didn't want somebody knocking on his door every five minutes and saying, tell me what to do. Tell me where to go. If he gave you a book to write, your job was to write it. And until you, you know, if you didn't screw up, you could write it forever. Much the same as Herb Trimpey as Penciler on the Hulk. He did a superb job, a wonderful, brilliant job. So he, he did the book for 12 years. Same with John on the F, John Buscema on the FF. Same with Jack, actually. He would have had the FF until he quit, which he did. That was an extraordinary, extraordinarily wonderful reality. You didn't have an editor looking over your shoulder. You were on your own. Sometimes it, it screwed up, but most of the time it really worked. And again, you know, when I was there, Len Wein was editor in chief. I was his associate editor. We were it. We ran the comic book company with a proofreader on the side, 45 books a month. And that doesn't happen anymore. Now there are, there are editorial departments up, down, and sideways. Everything is, 
is checked out, double checked, triple checked, conferenced, coordinated, it perhaps might be a more efficient reality, but it's not more fun. Or at least for those of us who were educated in the day, it's not more fun. But again, like, that's right. that's also like looking at the difference in movies back in the day versus the difference in once the studios took over versus the difference now where it's lawyers gathering up financing and shoot, taking your own shot. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll end up with, I guess, Batman and, and Superman, where you spend a half a billion and earn a billion. Or you can end up with Deadpool, where you spend a half a buck and earn a half a billion. <laughs> you win some, you lose some. Oh, well, I just, I've got a few more questions here, but I <laughs> also wanted to, I also wanted to check in on time. I'm not sure, uh, Mr. Claremont, how much time you have, because I know. I'll, talk fast. I'll try to talk less verbosely. Uh, no, please. I mean, that some great questions. I guess just one more. Uh, I wanted to get your take on a topic that I think is prominent in, in both um, the comics community and also society in general. Uh, diversity is an issue that's uh, more and more visible, both within comics and I think in general society. And it's something that it seems like you emphasized a lot in books like New Mutants. And I'm wondering if you have thoughts on how comics can approach diversity more effectively within stories and also how the industry can, I don't know, do better with diversity. The smart aleck answer is look out the window. Walk down the street, especially if you live in New York. Yeah. It's comics ideally are the production of two people, the writer and the artist, the pencil artist. The writer can describe any collection of scenes, characters, circumstances that he or she likes. The artist's responsibility is to bring them to visual life. You can ask for anything. I've had artists who, when I will go to the trouble of describing what I think is a great double page spread, and what I get back is a close up of the left side of the head and the, the tip of a sword. And it's a really powerful visual image. But as far as the actual double spread scene goes, it's a waste of two pages. I've had other artists who've taken a throwaway panel, which is number one, the first panel of a, of a five panel page and knocked it out of the park with a vengeance. That's my cheap shot reference to the Michael Golden panel from Avengers Annual 10, where the police lieutenant walks in the room, walks into the hospital and in the background, you see a nurse, a nun, a uniformed cop and a little kid. And I ended up writing a conversation between them because it, they were just wonderful as a visual presentation. And it's been 30 plus years and I still get questions about what that scene means, which to me means that Michael did his job and I did mine. If you want diversity, that's solely the province of the casting director in a film or the writer and the artist in the the artist primarily in the comic. Just look at any of the annuals that Art Adams, Arthur Adams and I did in the New Mutants, and you will see wonderful diversity and more characters than you can shake a stick at. John Byrne could do it, Dave Cockrum could do it, Mark Silvestri did it. More damn him in Wolverine with Larry Hama than he did with me in the X-Men pretty damn much in both it's i uh just jealousy pure <laughs> jealousy i love the because the issues that he and and larry did were really 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 good darn it <laughs> no i mean you it's finding the right the right penciler walter simonson in the x-men teen titans crossover where we just threw away really cool stuff for the fun of it. And by throw away, I mean, I don't mean we tossed it out of the book. We just threw in little scraps here and there that 
that would catch your eye and leave you wondering what does this mean? Who are these guys? What the heck's going on? We're not going to tell. We'll figure it out next time. But enjoy it while it's here. That's, you know, the whole, the whole idea behind the New Mutants was to get, as I said at the time, you guys can have New York all you want. I'll just take the other five continents. Because the delight for me as a writer is exploring the reality, the physical reality, the historical reality of South America, of various parts of Africa, of Asia, both Southeast and Central, of Europe even, and just see what we can discover, what, where, where the path will take us, what exciting new visual tropes can we throw down that will catch the reader's eye and make them go, wow, that they wouldn't have seen before. I think that's why I, as a reader, have been very happily intrigued by Ms. Marvel, the young Islamic girl. Mm-hmm. Kamala Khan, uh, yeah. That, to me, is, is an absolutely correct direction because it's, it's something we haven't seen before. And I think that should be what what comics are all about. Bear in mind, what will take Industrial Light and Magic years and millions and millions of dollars to create in terms of special effects, I can do just by asking Salvador La Roca or Art Adams or Walt Simonson or John Byrne, just draw this, okay? And they will do it wonderfully, and whammo, we'll be there. That's the point. What we'll take, I mean, there was an article last week of Richard Donner ta- about ri- a conversation between Richard Donner and Chris McQuarrie. Chris McQuarrie? Who directed Dark Knight? Was uh, that Chris McQuarrie? Chris Nolan? Chris Nolan. Too damn many Chris's. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't even gotten to the actors yet. <laughs> and, Donner was talking about how when he was doing Superman, it was all live. It, there were no special, there were no real special effects, you know, other than like model helicopters falling off the top of the, of uh, the daily news building, sorry, the daily planet building. And Nolan was explaining that in all three, the essence of all three dark Knight films is that there are virtually no special effects at all. I mean, visual effects other than tweaks here and there. And if you remember the opening scene of the third film, where Bane's associates parachute down from a C-130 and literally take the plane, the two-engine plane that Bane is on apart in midair, <laughs> hang it off a, a hooks attached to the 130, and then drop it. I mean, holy cow. That's amazing. You know, you sit back and you think, well, it's just CGI, right? No, it's real. The, all of the stunts in Fury Road are Mad Max Fury Road are real. That's wonderful for me as an audience. That's the kind of thing that makes you sit up and go, holy cats. <laughs> but it also costs a hundred million bucks. Whereas all I have to do is call my artist and say, Hey, why don't you do blah, 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 blah. And he or she can do it. That's what comics can do. Anything. All you have to do is have the imagination to envision it and the talent with your pencil to bring it to life. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's uh, that's all the question. I, I have more questions here. Oh, I had a question I really wanted to ask though after that. Please. Because you we, we brought up New Mutants, and we just did a podcast on uh, New Mutants 1 to 100, and Jamie and I were talking about it, and we said if this comic came out today, I think it came out in 1982, it would be by far the most diverse comic that Marvel was releasing. Mm-hmm. And I guess I just wanted you to, to speak about that, and I wondered if you agreed or not. What, that it's diverse? That it would be... The, one of the most, if not the most diverse comic. But that was, was the idea. Today. Yeah. I mean, we were locked into the X-Men, but mm. even then, Uncanny, my, my Uncanny was a fair, was significantly more diverse than the original right. five team, five members of the team. New Mutants was taking it a step further. And even there, I mean, 
Danny was Native American. Uh, Cannonball Sam was was Appalachian, you know, Celt immigrant. But Bobby was was from Brazil. Rain was from Scotland. Karma was a Vietnamese refugee, which I grant you made a lot more sense in 1975 than it did today. It would today. Amara was from South America fantasy land. But what the heck? If I'm gonna mm-hmm. if I'm gonna be indulgent, I might as well be indulgent. The one the one thing I regret about the visual for Amara is that the whole point of that city was it was supposed to be a blend of ancient Roman refugees and Inca. So what ideally she should have been a genetic blend of South American Indian and I guess Rome, sort of Celtic, well, European. But the point which we continued on with with the 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 series was to get as much variety as possible, simply because it's it's a big it's a big fun world. Let's let's explore it. Let's go see places we've never been and and do things, visit cultures that none of us are likely to see. That's why. For me, the most valuable book, research book I had at the time, and still do, is the National Geographic, because it was a a means of tapping in to societies, cultures, visual imagery that normally I wouldn't I wouldn't see ever. Now with global television and and more channels, and you know what to do with, it's a lot more facile. Uh, I mean grabbing hold of that stuff but back in the 70s you got what you you got what you could when you when you could and as i said seeing the same old week after week was kind of boring it more fun could i felt could be had by the again the culture shock of peter rasputin coming from a shtetl you know a, a collective farm outside in south central russia into the most urban city of the world. And what what does that mean? And the fun part for me would have been to, down the line, have them encounter perhaps some Chinese counterparts who felt that the Americans were from the Hicks side of the world because their culture is 5,000 years older. And let's face it, Shanghai is way more cool <laughs> than New York. Uh, Jake, I know you have to head out back to class. Sorry about that. Oh, no, 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 no problem. Yeah, I, I, I think I should head to class. But again, I, I really want to thank you for taking the time. It's been a real privilege talking, even for just a short time. So My thanks pleasure. again. Now that we got the computer working, <laughs> I'm just gonna. Sorry, you've been sitting so patiently all. <laughs> As in me and Mary, as we're just sitting here waiting. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> um, Jamie. Oh, I'd love... oh sorry, Mary. Talk to someone who's so, conditioned so. to be paid by the word. This is what you get. <laughs> Jamie, I was going to ask, I know you have some questions, but I was going to ask if you could uh, revisit that question I had in the first segment about Jean Grey and feminism, since you are our expert feminist, I I like to think. But yeah, feel free to take it on. I know you have a a bunch of questions to ask. I do. I can go back to Jean a bit more. I say I'm mostly interested in Jean because I've always loved her because I've never had a moment where I was reading Jean, especially when I was reading Dark Phoenix Saga, where I was like, oh, this feels like not real person. And Jean has always been a really complex character. So I've always wondered if you thought, how did you think about your characters, like Jean, as well as all of the other characters? What makes them real to you? What makes them interesting to you? Well, I pattern them after the people I know. My best friend has, I mean, woke up one one morning listening to an NPR broadcast from Sarajevo and Scott Simons talking to some guy and suddenly we start hearing these little like <laughs> sounds and my best friend suddenly shout you can hear a shouting in the background Scott will you duck your head they're shooting at us oh my goodness and yeah snipers were had opened up on them She's been to Sarajevo. She's been to uh, Mogadishu. She had a. She's been to South Africa when it was still apartheid South Africa, and almost got into a 
fatal situation with some insurgents there. She still did her job. I have another friend who is one of the most respected Pulitzer Prize winning infectious disease researchers on the, I don't know, perhaps in, in the country, if not on the planet. She has her own mop suit, mop suit for crying out loud. And she'll, you know, was known to go off hunting Ebola more than once going up, you know, up, up into the back end of Africa to see either to see what was going on. When you know people like this in reality, women and men, my feeling was if I'm going to swipe, I'll swipe from the best. And if I'm going to pattern the characters that I write after people that I know, I will use the people that I know who I think are totally cool. So it just, it's, it seemed totally natural to do that, to, to use the traits and attitudes and courage and determination of the real people I know to enrich the uh, fictional characters. And in the process, I would hope, make them more relevant and real to the audience and more memorable. And the thing with Gene was that I think what it all came down to at the end is what she says to Scott in the last page of the rewrite. And this is where the rewrite pretty much paid for itself uh, in terms of, yes, it was, it was gut wrenching, but it allowed me to say things that needed to be said, which were Gene's admittance that on one, the part of her knew I'm eating this star and it's really good. And even if I'd known there was an, even, even if I'd known I was killing five billion people in the process on the inhabited planet, on the, on the Dabari homeworld, I'd have done it anyway. Mm-hmm. Because I didn't know them. I was eating a star. And her confession to Scott is that feeling is still there. And I don't want to ever do that again. Except I do. So I'm, I'm pulling the plug. I mean, it, it, it's saying, in a sense, she's acting as her own judge and jury and executioner. It's not even so much a suicide as a sacrifice. Mm-hmm. But it, for me, it was, that was what helped catalyze the whole thing in terms of who she is as a person and who, what, what the moment was as a moment. Because the irony, the heartbreak in a way is that if you'd taken her a billion years down the evolutionary line, she would have been the phoenix and it all would have been well. But even then with the phoenix, you have to think it's the, the creature's role is very simple. Consume the universe and then give it rebirth. And uh, to do the one, everybody has to die. But everyone gets a second chance. So Gene just wasn't, to pardon the pun, old enough to deal with that yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so she pulled the plug. But that's, yeah. I mean, that's, that's why I felt it would have been better to leave, you know, I mean, the, the interesting thing is that Marvel's official stance now is that there is a distinct, diff- they are two separate beings, Gene and Phoenix. Mm-hmm. Which, whatever, <laughs> not my department. Well, I would say, especially with the the difference between Gene and the Phoenix, I feel like it's always been the best part about Gene as a character, like you were saying, is that she understood these things and then she made a choice. And that was like the ultimate tragedy and the ultimate sacrifice. And I think that's one of the realest things a person could do. But I wonder if you think that because like kind of of that perspective today, if people have such a good... I think that maybe you might have had a better grasp on character and feminism, at least with that character especially, than maybe people do today. Like, do you think that we've gotten better as time has gone on, or do you think we're still kind of having issues making these real characters? I think probably having issues. But Mm -hmm. I mean, it's also why I created Rachel. It's like that was Gene's happy ending in a sense that 
her death left a vacuum. The vacuum was filled by her, her daughter. And that's why in my, even though in her memory, Scott, she thought of Scott as her father, the actual relationship is that she is the child of Jean and the Phoenix. So she is actually the chance for Jean to have a second chance mm-hmm. through her, her child, which in a way is what I guess every parent likes to think or hope is that whatever foolishness we end up doing, our kids will get it right. Mm-hmm. But that's an, that's another story. <laughs> in terms of how everything is approached now, I don't know if you're, if you're talking in terms of how the publishing company approaches it. I have, you know, I mean, every writer has their own different vision and it's, that's why I, I don't, I generally don't read them, read X-Men comics anymore because I like seeing them the way I saw them and the, the approach of modern storytellers is filtered through editors and, and publishing necessities and story concepts. And I mean, the, the essence is looking at John's cover, John Burns cover for one of the compilations that was done for Dark Phoenix. The image is this really evil Phoenix on the front cover and then you flip over to the back cover and there are all the other, the rest of the X-Men and Jean Grey. And that in a sense epitomized John's vision of, of the conflict, but not mine. Mm-hmm. So there you have two creative minds alike in infamy and just at each other's at loggerheads. <laughs> hey, Jamie, do you want to continue? Uh, I was going to say, I actually have to go do a feminist protest because I'm a <laughs> really great feminist, apparently. <laughs> but I wanted to thank you very much for your time. And also, I wanted to thank you just in general for what you've done, because, of course, I, as I said, I always loved Dark Phoenix. Me too. <laughs> okay. Keep trying till I get it right. Thank you. Thanks so much, yes, of Jamie. Course. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Oh, this is perfect. Marius, it's you and me, the two co-hosts together. Oh, okay. <laughs> I know you had some questions as well. Uh, yeah, I did, in fact. So uh, I know, Mr. Claremont, that uh, you don't have that much time left, so I'm going to try and keep it short. But uh, this is something I have wanted to ask you about one of your works, the book X-Men The End, which is actually mm-hmm. uh, one of the, the, probably the first comic book of yours that uh, I read as a child, like when I was 12 years old. So my question was that uh, basically we're going to do a podcast this week about like the different concepts and dreams within the X-Men world, but especially Xavier's dream and uh, how they could be achieved. And uh, X-Men The End kind of gives us an answer to that. So in a sense that Kitty Pride, uh, as a president of the United States, uh, basically states that the mutants are not trying to be special anymore with flashy costumes and whatnot. Uh, and instead, they're kind of blending into society as mm-hmm. quote unquote normal citizens. And I feel like this has been like a very sensitive topic of discussion a while back when Havoc's infamous M word speech was released. So, um, I'm sorry, was kind of, which, uh, the M word speech. Did you hear that? It was from a uh, Rick Remender book. Basically, it was about like, an Avenger squad and within this uh, Avenger squad there were like mutants and non-mutant characters alike and they were kind of trying to promote uh, Xavier Stream in like a new uh, cooperative way and basically what happened was that the internet got really angry about uh, a page in which Havoc is saying in a public speech that he doesn't like the word mutant because he thinks that's decisive that he doesn't want to be uh, seen as a mutant but rather as like a person or as Alex. Okay. So um, there was I kind of like say, yeah. there was uh, kind of like a conflict between well, on the one hand, not wanting to be ashamed of your own break- background and instead being proud of who you are, versus not wanting to be defined by your genes. So that's uh, probably something you could relate to, for instance, like the LGBT plus community. So um, I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that in the light of what happened in the end of uh, X-Men, the end, and like the goal of achieving Xavier's dream. What's your take on that? Well, and 
the problem is my my vision of the, the the story arc is a little different in that what happens after X Men the End is Days of Future Past, so there really okay. isn't a happy ending. Oh, Kitty is overthrown as pres. She's the last president of the United States because the Sentinels take okay. over. That's and. Uh, then we have to come back and see what happens next after that. Oh my gosh, you just crushed okay. Marius' but, world. <laughs> uh, yeah, kind of. <laughs> but uh, that's that's Earth, Chris. I think the way stories tend to deal with things is, as I said, that's the, this is the responsibility of each individual writer. I tend to be far more or f- far less structured in the uh, that's probably not the right word i tend to like them more as individuals not as as statements of policy okay uh for havoc to go out and say i don't want you to call me a mutant i just want to be a person fine but and within the context of him being part of the avengers that makes absolutely perfect sense it's a totally legitimate and totally honorable thing to say but the vision I was following with the X-Men were that mutants were an extremely, extremely small subset of humanity. You're talking maybe a hundred odd characters out of a population of six and a half billion that was always defined by the rubric feared and hated by the world they were sworn to protect. There was, in my vision of the concept, a reason why they stayed hidden. And yes, some of them felt that was not, that might not be the right way to go vis-a-vis Kitty's thought to herself at the end of the uh, issue of New Mutants where a young boy commits suicide and she's giving the eulogy. We love that And issue. she thinks, you know, I'm standing here and I'm refusing to say what I am because I am afraid. And yet she does it anyway. I was more interested in the duality that how you deal with the fear of being an outsider and of being outed as an outsider rather than embracing the the reality and saying accept me or else that i think is a product of writing the book in 1988 as opposed to 2008 mm-hmm. which was the case with grant's x-men new x-men yeah so on one level you could say the passage of time has made the conflict more refined might even be better on the other hand the fact that the conflict still exists is an unfortunate consequence of itself yeah totally. uh each writer has to find a way to balance the struggle and present it to the reader in terms that the reader can identify with. I think, for me, the the thing I miss about the current crop of well, the current approach to the mutant, the existence of mutants, is it is not they are not easily identifiable. It used to be the phrase "feared and hated by the world they are sworn to protect" was a defining element. Now, I don't see anything instantly identifiable that makes them unique. They're just a bunch of super, a new, another bunch of superpowers that do good deeds. They could just as easily be members of the Avengers or the Uncanny Defenders or whatever the tactical name is for a, a series, but there's nothing that makes them any more or less special than whatever person happens to be wearing the Iron Man armor this week. Yeah. And uh, that could be viewed as a positive 
a pro a positive evolution of the concept or as a primal loss of of uniqueness i don't know that's again a judgment both for marvel management and marvel readership and, and i have to say i think one other other thing that we lose in this current generation of x-men although i still am a big fan but i think the metaphor that you created is, is lost a little bit i think that and i worry that when I was a kid, as someone who felt very much like an outsider, as someone who very much identified as a freak, when I was reading X-Men, there were other people like me who, who were, you know, doing these great things, but they still had sort of the same relationship with the world as I did. And I, I worry sometimes if there's, you know, a young adult or, or kid like I was, if they can have the same experience with the characters now. And that's a concern of mine. I think... The thing I find distressing, I guess, or the loss I find distressing is in a comic book world where humanity is infected with intelligent mist and they're all becoming inhumans and the ex, the mutants are antithetical to the population at large and who knows what will happen to them. Is that a metaphor for the attitude of presidential candidates who insist on the building of walls, on the forced repatriation of illegals. I don't know. It's it's an interesting an interesting question. And I don't know how or in what manner Marvel well, the writers and editors at Marvel will choose to resolve this. On the one hand you have the commercial necessity of wanting to keep these intensely successful characters around on the other hand how do you do that in a reality where you wish to emphasize one section of the brand identity versus another it could have an interesting it could be an interesting play what i'm more intrigued by is is it turning into potentially a fictional analog for what we're seeing in the real world. I don't know. Oh, for goodness sakes. <laughs> Three, four, five. Oh, no, four. Okay. <laughs> but, I mean, what I think is that if done right, this story could have some memorable and relevant points to make and consequences. But that's, again, that, that depends on on the instincts of of the editors and the writers and the capabilities of of the artists so clearly it's it's something that i would hope will attract the audience and excite the audience we'll just have to wait and see i think for me the, the key words are if, if done with care and sorry i think the key words from what you just said for me are you know if this is done with care and for me that that's what's gonna but that's every story yeah. every story is no, approached that way yeah. i mean it's you know I, i'm you have to understand i'm looking at this purely as an outsider primarily now i don't i don't have any regular connection with the editorial office or whatever the plans are for the individual books and characters i look on it very much as a reader though unfortunately i don't do that much reading of comics anymore it's just that the challenge is there let's you know the trick is to see where they where they choose to go from here and hopefully it will all turn out for the best for as for readers enjoying the stories for the company producing successful stories right Marius? Okay, so we did talk a lot about X Men, and if you, I mean, we're already long overdue, so um, we <laughs> would have some questions about uh, your work on Sovereign Seven left. Uh, sure. If you want to talk about that, sure. If not, that's absolutely fine with us. Nope, fine by me. Okay, cool. So basically, we wanted to dress like Sovereign Seven is one of your works that's not being talked about as often as uh, other works, such as uh, well, your X Men run, obviously. Despite it being well, pretty fascinating for several reasons, and what basically reasons? for, sorry, what reasons? 
diversity okay, being so, one. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt your so, answer. Uh, I, I think that uh, one of the reasons that uh, makes it interesting, is, which is probably uh, what it's best known for, is that uh, it's like the first 100% creator-owned book published by DC. And uh, that's not something uh-huh. that... I mean, it's like... On, at the same time, it's like taking place kind of in the broader, share, uh, broader and shared uh, DC universe. But uh, that's not something we're seeing that often by the big two companies with the big two companies, like 100% creator-owned titles and, and concepts that are still like inside the, the main canon. So uh, why do you think we don't see that that often? Or could that like be like a good model for the future to bring more creativity into like the comic book universes of Marvel and DC? Well, I think it was an experiment. Paul okay. Levitz, he wanted to see, well, you know, could they do something that would stand up with image and perhaps broaden the base of the DC universe uh, to the benefit of both creators and, and the canon? I, I thought it was a great idea. Unfortunately, the market crashed on the third issue and, and the series never really recovered. I mean, DC gave it a, a good three years and we tried our best. It just wasn't, you know, we, we could never find the right way to bond with, with, uh, DC readership. I mean, the, 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 the sad reality is that nine, nine out of 10 comic book series don't succeed. I was hoping for the one in 10. I kind of made it to one and a half, but uh, the one excellent aspect of this is that even though the series was canceled by DC, the concept, the characters, the reality came with me. So now it, I'm turning I'm turning it into a novel. Oh, not sovereign, but it's set in the universe, and we'll see how that goes. But I mean that's that's amazing. It, it in a concept way, pers- from a conceptual perspective, yes, I think creator own, even creator own that mixed with the the existing universe was a potential way of of going. The reality, though, is I suspect from both companies, they're making so much money off of their fully their wholly owned product. Why waste time? with stuff that isn't theirs. Right. You know, uh, if, if you can take Deadpool, you know, and make a half a billion dollars, you don't need a sovereign seven. Yeah. You know, and I suppose you could argue, is this really the time for a, a series one of whom salient moments is the inauguration of the first Islamic American president of the United States in, in the last annual, which I kind of feel, especially these days, was being nicely 10 years ahead of my time. And it's a shame that no one really, that the, the moment is not there to register because I, I don't think it would be, I mean, with, I can't even remember his name now. But with the character being sworn in and watching from the sidelines are Superman, Wonder Woman, and Batman, basically giving him, you know, expressing hope and faith in, in, uh, in his ascension to the White House. So, you know, that's me being <laughs> totally indulgent, but hopeful at the same time. I think I can I hopefully speak for a lot of Americans when I say I'm hopeful for something like that to happen soon. <laughs> hopefully in November yeah. will be a great time to start. Not a Muslim. Not for a while, right? Yeah. Not for a while. I, 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 no. I, unfortunately. I mean, you got to understand, living, living across the river from the Donald, it's a very interesting, it's been a very interesting week. I can only imagine, yeah. Yeah. No, Marius often asks me, he's like, are you guys serious or is this satirical yeah. reality? Yeah, I, and I, I, I said, unfortunately, we're unfortunately we're serious. Yep, this is America. Anything is possible. Satirical reality. Good and bad. Yeah. <laughs> it's unfortunate. So, okay, but... Oh, sorry, Marius, go. No, you go first. Sorry. Oh, no, no, you go. I think 
that uh, listeners might be really curious about like the concept of uh, that novel you were hinting at and like for those of uh, our listeners who have uh, finished reading Sovereign 7 uh, it kind of has like a metafictional kind of ending so where's that novel of yours uh, uh, taking off or what's the concept of that gonna be what can we expect it's family moves to crossroads things get weird okay it's a it's basically uh, a kid moves there from California and discovers that the town is literally strange. Okay. <laughs> you know, that the, there are fantastic creatures and stuff going on. It's, I, I hate talking about books until they're actually finished. So I'm being, Oh, it's okay. You don't. I'm being totally ob not oblique, but uh, vague. <laughs> okay. Um, but we'll see fingers you know it's ideally the beginning of of a series so i just have to make sure that uh, it a i finish it b it's good and c oh yes it sells right so okay so, fingers crossed uh, and i'll <laughs> no I'll, I'll i'll probably end up posting stuff as it, as we progress on uh my website just to okay. see if anybody's interested and uh, take it from there. And we'll definitely send people who come to the page on our site for this podcast uh, there when you're ready to put that stuff out there. So, uh, Oh, that'll be cool. Yeah, we would love to do that. Marius, do you want to lead into the word association and then maybe our conclusion? Uh, hold on a second. Sure. So I thought this thought would be that, fun. Yeah, uh, sorry, what go. we could do like is, could a little, uh, is play a little game of word association with you. Um, <laughs> So uh, perhaps you could say a word that comes to your mind when we mention, like, the character's name. Just one word each. Oh, okay. Okay, so we're starting. Cyclops. Um, Dad. Emma Frost. Evil. <laughs> okay. Wicked. Uh, Wicked more than evil, actually. <laughs> Xavier. <clears throat> Actually, if I could turn that into a sound, that, that sound into a word, that would probably work. Okay. Uh, frustrating. Frustrating. Okay. Oh, I agree with that one. I have to, I have a confession to make that as a child, I desperately wanted to be on Emma Frost Hellions, and I, I feel guilty now after you said that she was no, so don't. wicked. <laughs> She's not nice. I know, but because, you know, I was also really into that Firestorm mini series. Of course, the, the, interesting, the interesting point is if you go back and look through the the run right Aurora has been under her direct power mm. Kitty has been under her direct power they escaped you never know so I was thinking you know I've always does she have two moles in the in the heart of the X Men people you think are actually good guys who might turn out to be something completely different oh wow that's amazing wow, but that's character. just me <laughs> uh, okay your turn Marius. So, our next name, Jean Grey. Fiery. Danny Woonstar. Leader. What about Sam Guffrey? Anchor. Okay. What about Madeline Pryor? Lost. Storm? Aurora. That's fair. Uh, Rogue? Afraid. Kitty Pryor? The boss. <laughs> oh, I like that one. I must admit, like, Kitty Pride is probably my my favorite character in fiction overall, so I'm really happy about that answer. Well, you have to... For me, I can't think of Kitty without Lockheed, so okay. the two of them together are the boss. That's really something I can identify with. So the, the so other, the other, I have to say the other word that would probably work as well is the doctor. Oh, okay. That's actually DC's comics that are coming to me for tomorrow, the review copies. And I'm like, damn it, don't come now. It's interrupting our time. Mary, did you get to see, say Gambit? Uh, no, we didn't have Gambit uh, yet. At the moment, lost. Mm. Yeah. So Only because his film's in turnaround, it looks like. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. actually. No, it's not. It pisses me off. How come? I wrote it. Well, the outline, anyway. Oh, okay. Sorry. No, that's a that's a very good reason to be pissed off. <laughs> My first screen credit. Yeah. Aw. Um, and you were, I thought you were in, um, oh, but you were you're acting in. No, no, no. Writer's credit. Right. Oh, okay. I see. Oh. That's still pretty exciting, though. And it still sounds like they're trying to move forward with it, no? 
Uh, you're you know more than I do, I'm afraid. Okay. Right. Okay. Next one. I think we just have some left. What about Warpath? Warpath? Yeah. Uh lost. For, the, lost. Okay. for a similar reason, or just lost emotionally? Depends on which one. Whether you're t- talking about Jimmy or his younger brother. Oh, definitely James. Yeah, but lost because one's in the afterlife and one's trying to figure out what to do with his life. Yeah, James, I always felt a strong connection to you. I remember when, when um, was it John? Yeah, John passed away. Was it 96? Um, 94. 90, five, technically. 95, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mary, did you want to say anything before we get into the whole conclusion here? No, oh, I'm fine. I think it was, you had a couple of more. Oh, did we have more? Mary, Scott, Melon sorry. Pryor. Oh. Melon Pryor. Conflicted. Mm. All right. What about Empath? Em- who's Empath? Uh, Manuel de la Rocha. Uh, he was the lead- leader of the. Oh, Hines. him. Yeah. Asshole. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did always wonder, like, what did Amara see in him? I just never. I liked them as a couple when I was younger, but I didn't get what she saw in him. Just because she's beautiful doesn't mean she doesn't make mistakes. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> this is true. You know, um, sometimes it's like not all endings are happy and not right. all not all people make turn follow the right the right course and being roman she might appreciate challenges i don't know mm. right or he's just a really really slimy piece of work and he's playing games and she's falling for it you know That's such a it's good point. Or she's doing it to really piss off her mom. <laughs> or, sorry, her grandma. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Now, what, yeah. What's what's a word you associate with her? With Celine? With the, with the Black Queen? Mm-hmm. Scary. Mm. That she definitely was. Maris, did you have any others you wanted to mention? Uh, no, not really. Are we getting into the conclusion? Uh, yeah. Unless you, want, unless you want us to name some more. <laughs> if you got any more, throw them out. You know, I was always curious... What you thought of Jetstream, for instance. He was also in the Hellions. Sam's sort of, um, he was from Morocco, yeah. if I believe. Under construction. Mm. How about Ilyana? Ilyana already. Ilyana? Oh, you, yeah. Definitely scary. Okay. I have to say, I miss, Marius and I talk about this all the time. I miss the sweeter Ilyana from New Mutants. She's a little bit, she's a little mean now. <laughs> That's because Kitty has discovered guys. <laughs> right. <laughs> How about Rachel Gray? Don't piss her off. <laughs> All right, yeah, I think that I think that does it for our list. That was that was really cool. I wasn't sure if you were going to go for that. I'm like, how is this going to go? But yeah, that was really. I thought that was really insightful from us on the Definitely. on the reader's end. Yeah, Mary, did you want to say anything before I launch into the whole conclusion? No, I'm I'm fine. All right, cool. Yeah, well, you know, I was going to say how lucky we are, and, and unfortunately, Jake had to go. But you know, as we're both Columbia University students, and we, you know, we know that you donated to the archive of Butler Library, and they had a whole speech kind of planned, but that piece of paper didn't get pr- printed out. So I hope that this I can do it justice. But it's funny that the first comic I ever picked up in my life, I was six years old, and it was classic X Men, which were reprints of the Uncanny X Men, and it was classic mm-hmm. X Men thirty seven, and it was the episode, oh, sorry, the issue of Uncanny x-men where you know gene kind of throws up her hand and she saves kitty from being attacked from the hellfire club and then gene and emma go on to have a, a you know a big sort of fight at the end and mm-hmm. you know all these years later you know i, I i'm in the, in the interest of being honest and as people on our site know I, I wrote this open letter about the kind of effect that the profound effect that x-men comics had on me while i was growing up and i mentioned it a little bit here but I was sitting at Columbia my second semester there. I took comics and graphic novels as literature. This is before Paul Levitz's class, which was American graphic novel. And mm-hmm. I, Karen Green, who I'm sure you know, brought us into the library. And I was the last person to sit down. And I sat down, and they, you had, and I think they were just going through all the stuff you had donated. And I sat down, and I looked right below, and it was your script, which was it looked like it was typed on a typewriter and partially handwritten. And it was the yep. exact issue of the first comic I had ever read. And well, I see, just, there's synergy for you right yeah i was gonna say that was some synchronicity and i remember leaving and i said man i'm like i wish that there was something i could do with this comic stuff and in that same class was kathy was who i started the podcast with and ironically she's an editor at marvel now working on the guardians of the galaxy book but you know i really have to say like when i started working in this medium when i started 
in the, you know, in the medium of critiquing comics and talking about them and on the podcast. And I went back to all the comics that had had a huge effect on me. So many of them were from your time in X-Men. So many of them were, were new mutants too. I, I, I didn't know until even recently, like that it had such a huge effect on me. And my parents are awesome people. And, and by no means would I ever complain about my life being unlucky. I think I had such a lucky existence, but I think I was a kind of artist child in my head. And, you know, my parents were kind of pragmatic and a little bit older. And, I, you know, at, at school, I was very different. I was overweight. I was picked on a lot. And, you know, when I came home, I would stay in my room and read comics and my uncle would just buy me all the referrals he used to call them where they would be like star look up this issue and he would just mm-hmm. so i had so many comics to read and and i would draw covers of my own comics specifically new mutants and you know i was just so drawn to the fact that this, there was this, a family and they were a family made up of all different people who accepted each other and for a long time it was honestly the only place that i felt like that i got acceptance was when i was reading these and 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 i think that what saved me from being a bitter person and if i'm not a bitter person and i'm not gonna lie therapy has helped too but i think that what sort of went ingrained in my head were were the x-men and the new mutants and, and saying you know what the obviously the world is not accepting me for whatever reason and i don't feel normal and i am different and it was just i i, I mean when i think about one of the strongest voices in my head growing up that affected so much of the art i created for myself when I was acting and, and doing photography, so much of it was from stuff that you read. And, and, and it's almost like a lot of the characters you wrote, their voices were in my head. So I just wanted, I just really wanted to thank you for that. And I can honestly say, like, without you, you know, I never would have taken that class at Columbia. I never would have had the idea to start comics first. You just met two of my best friends in the world. Marius is another one. And none of this would really be in existence if I didn't, you know, pick up that first comic that day at the newsstand in the mall in 1989 or whatever it was. So just on behalf of us and comics first and myself, I just wanted to really say thank you for. Oh, no, thank you. I mean, that's, there's not really much one can say in response other than this. I'm afraid my standard, but true rubric, which is, I'm not done yet. So <laughs> fingers crossed. Uh, I can, the next characters, the next book, the next adventure that comes down the line will be as satisfying and as exciting. I can't wait. And and I have to say that I'm so thankful that these books are out there for other people who are in a similar position to I was, or, or even now. And, you know, I hope that they pick them up and, you know, as we try to have a lot of X-Men podcasts here. I always am saying, you know, go pick up X-Men. So again, on behalf of us, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Mary. Sorry to, to babble on at, at such great length. Oh my gosh. I believe me. I babble so much worse than you do. <laughs> <laughs> no, my Babylon is more cool than your Babylon. <laughs> oh no, your Babel is m- way cooler. My Babel is not cool. My Babel is just kind of all over the place. No, 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 not Babylon. Babel- Oh, oh. <laughs> but it was really insightful, and uh, we were really happy to hear that. And I think I c- I can definitely agree uh, with what Justin was saying. And like from my point of view, it's like I'm kind of like this new generation of comic book readers, I guess. Like I grew up with like a lot of uh, 2010, 2000, 21st century kind of X Men books that I would say deviate from uh, what you've done with the concept and what you've done with the team. But going back and exploring the classics, especially God Loves Man Kills, which was which is uh, more than 30 years old now, and I think it that was really I, it wasn't only worth doing, but it was also extremely interesting to see like this idea explored the, uh, the similar ideas explored to what i've been thinking about what uh, we've all been thinking about about acceptance about uh trying to achieve like peaceful coexistence and the political metaphors that come along with that and this is why i think uh, your work is just so important to us uh, because it's so timeless and it's so like spot on what we also want to be about so thank you thank for you. that that's very very kind i I guess on the one hand, as a, as a writer and an egotist, I find it's, it, one feels proud to do a, a work that has that kind of resonance. On the other hand, it's heartbreaking to do a work that still has that kind of yeah. necessity and resonance. You know, it, it, the hope is that, that sooner or later we'll learn and, well, Fingers crossed, but yeah. Thank you again for, the, for those 
for those words. It's, they're, they're very, very much appreciated. So I, I, oh my gosh, I forgot my thought a little bit. I think I wanted to um, speak for Marius when I say that I hope in a few years we can all look at God Loves, Man Kills and wonder what this time had to be like for a book like this to have to be written because we're so mm-hmm. much more evolved. So I hope that day comes. And being, and being an arrogant, e- egocentric creator, I hope in a few years I'll have done something even better. Absolutely. And fingers crossed. Absolutely. And we will be um definitely promoting Sovereign Seven and any other work that you do. So we're really excited about that. And, and again, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. It was great meeting you. Yes. See you. All right. Same same from me. Have a good one. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye bye.